All right, welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you joining us today for Dr. Ferland's webinar on opioids for neuropathic pain. Um, my name is Jillian Tallman and I'll be moderating the webinar today. I work on the communications team here supporting Pain HQ. Pain HQ is an initiative out of McMaster University and we aim to provide accessible, evidence-based information on neuropathic pain. Um, and I'm just going to start off with a couple of housekeeping items today. We will be recording this webinar and the link to the video will be posted on our site within a couple of business days. Uh, we will also have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, so you'll be able to type your questions into the chat box. Um, they will be sent to me and then I'll relay them to Dr. Ferlin. After the webinar, you will see a window pop open uh, with a short evaluation of today's session. It won't take more than five minutes to complete. It's, it's only six questions, um, and we really encourage you to provide us with your feedback. This helps us understand how to make these webinars more useful for you, uh, what you liked or didn't like, and, and what topics you'd like to see in the future. So we're very excited to have Dr. Ferlin with us today. Um, she is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto and a staff physician and scientist at the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute. She is also an associate scientist at the Institute for Work and Health in Toronto. Um, she received a CIHR New Investigator Award and her research focus is on treatments of chronic pain including medications, complementary and alternative therapies and rehabilitation and has extensive experience in reviewing the scientific literature for the Cochrane Collaboration and for clinical practice guidelines. She was the team leader for the development of the Canadian Opioid Guideline and is now involved with the Guidelines National Faculty in Dissemination and Implementation of the Guideline across Canada. She developed the Opioid Manager, a point-of-care tool for physicians using opioids for chronic pain, and is co-chair of ECHO Ontario for pain and opioid stewardship. So a lot of background in this area and we are really fortunate to have her with us today. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Dr. Ferlin? Yes, uh, thank you very much. So, uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Great. So, uh, let me see here. How do I advance this slide? What do I have to do to advance this slide? You should be able just to click on it. Okay, there you go. So, uh, that's me because it's uh, funny that at uh, this webinar, um, people don't see our faces, so that's my picture. And um, I have to acknowledge uh, my institutions, the Toronto Rehab, the University of Toronto Institute for Working Health, and CIHR for funding me personally and my research that I do. And thank you so much for the Paying HQ people for inviting me to talk about this topic today. So uh, in terms of conflict of interest, um, I don't have any pharmaceutical company conflicts of interest to declare, never received any pharmaceutical company in uh, money for any research or for travel, but there might be a perceived conflict of interest because I'll be talking about uh, the Opioid Manager app for iPhone and iPad for physicians. Uh, it's muted. This week uh, we lowered the price because of the US dollars and the Canadian exchange, so we lowered to 799. Uh, but the other resources that I'll be talking about, um, the My Opioid Manager, which is for patients, uh, it's a free app in iBook, uh, but it's the printed copy costs $20 and it's being sold by the Canadian Pain Coalition. I don't get any money from the sales, uh, both apps and the book are owned by the University Health Network, which is a hospital that I work for. So the learning objectives for this uh, webinar, I hope that at the end of this presentation, uh, participants will be able to do three things. One is to explain the scientific evidence to support the use of opioids for neuropathic pain. Second one is to describe the mechanisms by which opioids may cause chronic pain to become worse. And three is to communicate better with your healthcare provider when talking about opioids prescriptions. So um, as Julian mentioned before, um, I was the team leader for the Canadian Opioid Guideline that was released in 2010. I was the leader of the research team. And this is a guideline uh, that is available at the National Pain Center, McMaster University, for anyone to read, to download. It's a little, it's becoming out of date. Uh, guidelines become out of date soon. But um, a group at the McMaster 
uh, are updating this guideline now, so hopefully by next year we'll have a new version. And uh, basically the guideline recommendation says um, there's a section one that talks about uh, when to initiate opioid therapy for chronic pain, a section two that says how to conduct an opioid trial, section three that um, helps uh, physicians and healthcare professionals to monitor people on long-term opioid therapy. And then there are specific sessions for uh, populations like uh, elderly, adolescents, pregnant women, psychiatric comorbidities. And lastly, there is a section in the guideline that talks about uh, managing chronic pain in a population that has uh, substance use disorder, uh, concomitant disorder. And uh, the key messages of the Canadian Opioid Guideline, I kind of summarized this in five points. Um, and this is a, a very, very succinct uh, method of remembering what is in the guideline. And it basically says that uh, before prescribing opioids to any chronic non-cancer pain, the physician, the healthcare professional has to know the patient very well, has to do a comprehensive assessment and really ensure if opioids is the best option for that patient, especially identifying the risk-benefit ratio. The second one is set goals with the patient because most people don't know that opioids cannot eliminate chronic pain completely. It's different from acute pain where most opioids can reduce pain dramatically, but it doesn't happen with chronic pain and I'll try to explain this later in my talk. So when patients have unrealistic expectations, thinking that uh, opioids will eliminate 100% of their pain, and then they, this is unrealistic, that's not an effective goal, and uh, patients need to be informed about uh, what, what is the opioids can do, and also how to monitor this effectiveness. The other thing is the dose of opioids. We know from scientific evidence that we don't need to go very high on a daily dose of uh, opioids and we track this in terms of morphine equivalents, usually below 200 milligrams of morphine equivalent is enough to treat the majority of chronic non-cancer pain, including neuropathic pain. The fourth one is always to make sure that the patient is not at a higher risk, especially because of new emerging risks or complications or they are developing uh, some addiction to the opioids, which is a very unfortunate uh, outcome. And uh, also the healthcare professional needs to learn and know how to stop opioid therapy uh, because it's easy to start these medications but it's very hard to stop, taper the opioids and stop these medications. So to help uh, healthcare professionals in Canada to apply the recommendations of the guideline, I developed the opioid manager which is, this is the page one, it's a two-page document uh, that can be printed, can be downloaded, it's also available for electronic medical records. It, this is the one that became an app that physicians can buy for $799. And uh, this helps them to monitor and remember everything that they need to look at every visit or before they put someone on opioids. And as you see here, it's very busy. I don't expect you to read every detail here. The reason that it's very busy is because it's not easy to prescribe opioids. You see how many things we have to monitor, to assess, to document, to measure, to ask. So usually in one visit, it's really impossible to do all of this. So we need to bring the patient a couple of times and do all of these assessments and make sure that we are doing the best for our patients. This is the My Opioid Manager, because uh, the Opioid Manager is for physicians and the, the patients were asking us if there was a, a version for them. So we, I and uh, our clinic nurse, Amy Robidas, we wrote a book for our patients. It's called My Opioid Manager that explains uh, how to use opioids and um, this is a free iBook. If you have an iPad, you can download this for free. It's also all the tools in the book are available for Android and iOS platforms for free. But if you want a printed copy of this book, you can ask the Canadian Pain Coalition and they will send you a copy of the printed book. So, changing subject here. How, what is the scientific evidence of opioids for chronic neuropathic pain? I, I did a systematic review and meta-analysis and it was published in 2012. 
Uh, this was done for the Canadian guideline, but it's a little bit out of date. And I found uh, this is a group of, um, of people that I know them very well. They are very reputable. They work in Germany, and they updated the um, systematic review specifically for neuropathic pain. So I will summarize for you what they did. So what they the, the type of studies that they included uh, were only randomized controlled trials that had uh, men and women of any age and race or ethnicity diagnosed with central or peripheral neuropathic pain. And the neuropathic pain had to be at least three months duration, so chronic neuropathic pain. They included any randomized trial that had uh, opioids given by oral or transdermal routes. And they only compared, uh, they only included studies that compared uh, opioids to placebo. And this is because they wanted to get a sense of what is the best effect of opioids for neuropathic pain. If you compare to another intervention, to another drug, your effect size may not be so large, but usually compared to placebo is what we call efficacy studies. And this is the best that we can get. If you want to get the highest effect of any drug, you use a randomized controlled trial design, you compare to placebo, and in the case of opioids, you measure in a very short uh, term. So they measured uh, pain intensity. They also looked at a proportion of patients reporting 50% pain relief. They also looked at a global improvement, of, um, which is how much did you improve. Also, they looked at function and proportion of patients that withdrew due to lack of efficacy. And they were interested in studies that um, measured these outcomes for at least four weeks. They didn't include any studies that uh, looked at uh, outcomes after one week or two weeks. The study had to have at least four weeks duration. And they divided into 4 to 12, 12 to 26, and longer than 26 duration. And you see that they only found 12 studies that match all these inclusion criteria. So the next slide, oops, here. So the, this is a graph that they included in their review showing the risk of bias in these 12 randomized trials. So green is good, means that there's not a lot of bias, and red is bad, there's a high risk of bias. And we see that in these 12 randomized studies, mostly the biases that were critical were uh, attrition bias, which means people dropping out uh, of the study during the study duration, also selective reporting, selection bias, and funding bias. Mm -hmm. And funding bias was basically because most of the studies, you see that more than half, had some conflict. Uh, they were funded by pharmaceutical industry. So the 12 randomized trials, they included four of them were for painful diabetic neuropathy, Three were for posipatic neuralgia. Two was for mixed polyneuropathy, polyneuropathic pain. Uh, one for lumbar root pain, one for spinal cord injury, and one for post-amputation pain. The mean study duration was six weeks. As I said before, they only included studies that had more than four, and they only found studies between four and 12 weeks. Unfortunately, there were no studies more than 12 weeks duration, which is, uh, which is a problem because we don't have randomized trials that they follow these patients more than 12 weeks. We have to rely on observational studies if we want to know what happens beyond 12 weeks. But this gives us a sense of, uh, again, what is the best that we can get? What is the best pain relief in an efficacy trial, randomized trial, everything is under control, it's compared to placebo, and we know that opioids have the best effect in the first few weeks that you give opioids because after a couple of weeks or months or years, the body develops some tolerance and dependency and the effects usually fade away. So if you want to know what is the best effect of opioids for neuropathic pain, this is the design that we want to see. And in these 12 trials, they included morphine, tramadol, oxycodone, and tapentadol. So I will just explain to you the numbers that we will see, uh, because if I just show you the numbers, you may not know how to interpret those numbers. But the first thing that we're going to see is the outcome of pain intensity. This is a hypothetical case. I want you to understand what this number means. 
So in a study A, hypothetical study A, if you give opioids and the pain is 40 in a scale from 0 to 100, and a person taking placebo, so 100 people taking placebo, you have a mean of pain intensity of 60, you have a difference at the end of the study of 20 points. And this is what we call mean difference. So here is mean difference. This diamond is what we call a diamond of a, a range and a standard error here, standard deviation. Because this diamond here doesn't cross the zero line, this is statistically significant. When this diamond or when this line here crosses the zero, then we say, well, there is no difference because it was not statistically significant. Let's see another hypothetical case here. Imagine now that we have two studies and we we're going to do a meta-analysis of these two studies, which means we're going to combine these two studies as if they were one study. So here is study A combined with study B, and this is a meta-analysis of study A and B. The reason why I'm showing you this is because this is a standardized mean difference. Why I'm using standardized mean difference here and not a mean difference is because the scale that they use for study A was probably a scale from 0 to 100. So you ask the patient, 0 is no pain, 100 is the most unbearable pain that you can imagine. So at the end of the trial, people said 40 in the opioid group and 60 in the placebo group. If you have a study B that did not use the same scale, so for example, this one, they use a scale from uh, 1 to 8, or it could be a scale from 0 to 10. It's different from using a scale from 0 to 100. And the people in the opioid group, um, at the end of the trial, they had a 5.5. And the placebo group, they get a 6.1. So you see, so this is a, a graphical representation of this study. We can't now talk about a real number, real mean difference. So then we have to standardize this mean difference. And we get a number here that doesn't have any unit, doesn't have any, doesn't make any sense, this number here. However, uh, Cohen, in 1988, uh, he kind of uh, helped us to to look at these numbers that don't have any any doesn't these numbers don't make any sense. They are called standardized mean differences or effect sizes. And Cohen said, if an effect size is 0 0.2, it's a very small, almost um, no difference between the two groups. If the effect size is 0.5, well, yeah, you can say it's moderate difference. Now, if the effect size is 0.8 or, or larger than 0.8, we're talking about a large effect size. So, now I'll show you what this meta-analysis found for opioids and neuropathic pain. So, for pain intensity, they found 11 studies, and all of these studies, they used different scales to measure pain intensity. So, they had to calculate a standardized mean difference, and it was 0.64. It was statistically significant. You see it goes from minus 0 0.81 to minus 0 0.46. So we say this there was moderate benefit with opioids for pain intensity. Not large, it's moderate. But for function, look at the functional um, standardized mean difference. It was 0 0.28. It was statistically significant, but very small. So there's a very small benefit with opioids. So, this is the best that opioids can give in, in a short randomized trial. We know that um, this is only three months duration, and if people continue taking opioids, they will not get better than this. They will not get a, an effect size that is higher than this and this. What happened to the other outcomes? What happened to the number of patients with 50% pain reduction? That's a different kind of outcome. It's a counting event. We don't have a continuous scale anymore. So in your counting events, uh, for example, in the opioid group, there was, uh, this again, this hypothetical. You have a study C with 70 people that had, for example, number of patients with 50% pain reduction. And let's assume that in the placebo group, there was 40 people. So the difference was 70% here minus 40%. That's the difference we are seeing 30% reduction. So that's what this diamond here is, and that's what this line here. Another study, let's say that now we have uh, another study that has 70% people 
obtaining 50% reduction in pain with opioids and only 60% with pain reduction in placebo. So you see now that the difference is only 10% and it's not statistically significant because it crosses zero here. It goes from minus 0 0.03 to plus 0 0.23. Now, if we do meta-analysis, we combine study A, C, and D. So when you do meta-analysis, you kind of put everybody in one big study. So now let's say this diamond here is like if we had a study of uh, 350 people here plus 350 people here. So a, a big study with 700 people. But you see each one of the studies had a small difference than 8%, 10%, 5%, the, none of them were significant, but now because you put them together, you increase your sample size, and you have a difference of 7%, but a difference that is statistically significant, and people get very, uh, a lot of attention when you get a statistically significant result, but it can be a statistically significant result of a very small difference. So let's see what we found. So there was only one study that looked at um, number of patients with 50% pain reduction and the risk difference was only 16% and it was not significant. It went from minus 4% to plus 35%. So there was no difference. When they looked at a uh, number of patients dropping out due to lack of efficacy, uh, the risk difference was only 7%. And again, remember this is a difference from placebo. We're talking about a difference uh, between, you know, 7% here, 8% here, 16% is a very small, very small difference. Th this was not statistically significant. This two were. And we're talking here about dropping out due to adverse events. So what the authors of this meta-analysis concluded was that in the short-term studies, only studies that measure between 4 and 12 weeks in chronic neuropathic pain, Opioids were superior to placebo in terms of efficacy and they were inferior in terms of tolerability. But they concluded that uh, short-term opioid therapy may be considered in selected chronic neuropathic pain patients. So the key words here is short-term opioid therapy and selected chronic no neuropathic pain patients. So it's not for everybody with neuropathic pain and it's not for long-term duration, it's just for short-term duration. So there is a study published last year in 2015 by a group in Alberta and what they found was uh, the patients who are not prescribed opioids, they find more improvements in physical function. This was a prospective cohort study. They included 789 patients from a neuropathic pain registry in Canada and they had completed data from 535 patients. So again, this is not a randomized trial. Uh, as I mentioned before, when you go beyond three months, you have to look at data from observational studies, the studies that are not randomized, and this is one of them done in Canada and just published last year. So they followed these patients for 12 months and they asked them to complete functional scales and they found that after adjusting for disease severity, neuropathic pain patients who were not on opioids had lower disability and higher physical functioning scores. This study was funded by Canada Foundation of Innovation and Pfizer. So again, the message is opioids, what is the scientific evidence of opioids for neuropathic pain? The effects are very small. The effect sizes, the benefits are very small. They are better in the initial weeks when you prescribe opioids. After many weeks, months, or years, there are no observable benefits after many years. But there is also an issue of selecting the right patient, which is the uh, next topic that I'll be talking in this webinar. But before I go to the next topic, I'd like to say that uh, there is a Canadian Pain Society released uh, in 2014 this algorithm, and you had a webinar by Dr. Dwight Mooling, who is uh, one of the, uh, the main author of this algorithm. And he presented to you, opioids are only second line in the treatment of neuropathic pain. Really, we should try to uh, use all of our first line alternatives before, like gabapentinoids, tricyclic antidepressants, 
uh, antidepressants type of SNRIs like uh, fluoxetine and duloxetine. And when these medications fail, we can add an opioid. But uh, we see so many patients that didn't have a good trial and attempt of these medications before they are put on opioids long term. So I'd like to show a video. This is a video of a patient that I treated uh, many years ago. Um, he has neuropathic pain and he, he was, we had to put him on opioids for a couple of months, I think uh, up to three years before we um, took him out of the opioids and now he's doing so much better and his testimonial is so compelling because he, he got a lot better. Ricardo is a patient of mine. In 2006, he was 26 years old and he suffered a motorcycle accident here in Toronto. It was a big accident. He had to be rushed to the hospital and he was in coma for two weeks due to a brain injury. He had uh, fractured ribs, perforated lungs and a fractured pelvis and femur. He also had a brachial plexus injury which means that he was left with uh, his left arm paralyzed. This injury also left him with a chronic neuropathic pain in his left arm and hand. His pain after this accident was very intense. When I saw him for the first time in 2008 at the Toronto Rehab Institute, he described the intensity as 10 out of 10, the worst possible pain. In the beginning, the treatment plan included physiotherapy, occupational therapy. We had to provide him with some arm support and also with some medication so he could endure all these exercises, the therapy, and to try to relieve his pain. We had to use a lot of uh, medications and interventions, including antidepressants, anticonvulsants for his pain. We also used some opioids to help manage his pain and to help him function better. He's not on any opioids today. He used opioids for about three years and we were able to stop them gradually by tapering slowly so he would not have any withdrawal symptoms. He is now only on an anticonvulsant medication for his pain, but most important, his goals were achieved, and he's happy, and he's very functional every day. Thank you. Uh, we can go back to my slides. So why don't you find my slides? Let me start talking about the types of uh, chronic pain. Yes, there they are. I can see them. So the reason why we say that uh, uh, the patients with neuropathic pain have to be very well selected for whom you're going to put a, on opioids is because not all chronic pains are the same. Muted. True for neuropathic and non-neuropathic pain. Uh, this is what I call the good, good chronic pain and the bad chronic pain. And I'll try to explain to you what is. Um, first, I have to explain what is chronic pain, what, the, what chronic pain does to the brain of a person that has uh, chronic pain. So if you imagine that pain is the alarm system of our bodies, like the alarm system of, of a house, you install the alarm system because, and then you install sensors in every room, sensor for burglary, fire, you know, carbon, carbon monoxide or any magic, medical emergency. These sensors send information to a panel on the wall, the panel transmits to a central uh, place outside of your house. And uh, I'm not doing any advertisement for ADT here. It's just because I got this from the from Google, and I found this uh, diagram very useful. Uh, but uh, then uh, the central will send the police or fire uh, fire trucks and ambulance to the house to see what's wrong. Our pain system is exactly the same. We have sensors in our body, in our skin, in our muscles, or joints. Uh, or organs, internal organs, and they are there to alert our spinal cord first if there is anything wrong. So we have sensors for touch, pain, pressure, temperature. They send this information to the spinal cord. The spinal cord then transmits to the brain. And then the brain has the ability of sending down what we call descending inhibitory pathways, sending a lot of inhibition to this pain, what's going on here. So this is if the pain system is functioning normally. 
and uh, everything would be okay. So that's the good pain. The good pain is your brain is being alerted that something is wrong and it's really true. So there is a cut in your skin or you put your toe in a fire and the brain needs to know. The bad chronic pain is when this pain system is malfunctioning. The pain system of your body is now broken. It's um, deregulated. And there, are, there has been now some short circuits here. The person, you know, touches the skin and feels pain. Or someone applied pressure to a muscle. It was not supposed to transmit pain, but you put pressure on the muscle and they feel pain which means that there is something wrong with the transduction of the impulse from here to here or from here to here. So let's see this in a little bit more details. In the, you know, the pain system is a new discovery. Uh, it, it, it was discovered in maybe 50 years ago, and it was a discovery by two scientists in Montreal, Dr. Patrick and Dr. Wall. They were the first ones to describe that we had this pain system. You know, we, we, are, we know about the digestive system, the cardiovascular system, the urinary system for so many hundreds of years, but the pain system is a new discovery. In the 16th century, we thought that pain was just an electrical impulse, so if you put your toe on the fire, there's an electrical impulse that goes to the brain, and that's it. That's what pain is. Now we know about this ascending uh, pathway, we know about the descending inhibitory pathway, we know that these pathways can be sensitized, we know that there are factors that are influential in how the brain becomes sensitized, like genetics, mood, attention, prior, prior experiences. So what happens when a person has pain and now the pain is not a symptom of a disease, but now the pain is the disease itself? Let's see some things that happen at the level of the spinal cord. This is a synapsis in the spinal cord. So this is the neuron coming from the periphery. This is the neuron that will be transmitting the impulse to the brain. And this is the inhibitory neuron that comes down from the brain to try to inhibit the synapsis. This is a normal synapsis that happens in a normal pain state. Now, if the pain now becomes the disease, which means there is some neuroplastic changes in the, that synapsis, you see how different this synapsis is from this one? This is an acute phase of a central sensitization. We are looking at the spinal cord level, and you see a lot of receptors here that exist now, and they didn't exist before in a normal synapsis. One of these receptors is a receptor for NMDA. So just try to remember this thing. An NMDA receptor doesn't exist in a normal synapsis. Now it's an abnormal synapsis in an acute phase. If we don't do anything here in the acute phase of chronic pain, in the late phase of chronic pain, what happens is there is no more impulse coming from the periphery. Here, this, this neuron is not firing anything, but it's the postsynaptic uh, neuron here that is now firing itself. You see that it's releasing substances that activate itself. So its synapsis here is sick, is malfunctioning. There is no impulse coming from the periphery, but the brain is continuing to receive information that there is pain. And later, if we don't do anything here, there is disinhibition which means the brain loses the ability to inhibit the synapses. The synapses continue going on and on and on. And we don't have, the brain doesn't have the capacity now to inhibit this synapses. So the pain continues itself at the level of the spinal cord. What is opioid-induced hyperalgesia? So this is a term that we use to say that now opioids are causing pain. Hyperalgesia means pain. So people who have, uh, have been using opioids for a long time, they, and they start describing that the pain now is in a larger body, uh, a larger area of their body. They have hyperalgesia, which is the skin is very sensitive to touch and pressure. It's because the opioids, they activate that NMDA receptor. Remember that NMDA receptor that I showed you? What happens is there is an influx of calcium and enhances the excitability which means that now the, the abnormal pain impulse can be transmitted much faster and much louder. 
So I tell my patients if they have central sensitization and we put them on opioids, it just makes their, their abnormal pain to go louder and faster. That's what happens at the spinal cord. What happens at the brain level? So if a person has chronic pain, uh, chronic pain itself affects the brain. Chronic pain changes the brain. This is well documented. Let me show you some things that happen. So Dr. Vanya Pikarian, in 2004, he published a very important paper. And since 2004, he has been publishing so many researches showing the same thing over and over, and many other researchers. Uh, I just chose one of his slides. This is what happens to the brain. So he took people that don't have any chronic pain, these are the controls, and people who have chronic back pain, and he measured the gray matter in the brain. And you see that people who have chronic back pain has less brain gray matter, which means that the brain is atrophy to the point that if we compare a person, 50-year-old person that doesn't have chronic pain, they have a brain that is equivalent to a, uh, so a 50-year-old person that doesn't have uh, any chronic pain is equivalent to a six, uh, sorry, a 40-year-old with chronic pain. So a person that has pain, uh, chronic pain every day, the brain gets atrophy about 10 years, so it gets older 10 years. And more chronic pain the person has, more years, more atrophy happens. So this is what this graph here shows, that it's, it's uh, the longer the pain duration, the more brain atrophy happens. He also showed that um, there is a difference between people that have a, a, a known neuropathic chronic back pain. So a chronic back pain that don't have any, doesn't have any neuropathic pain characteristics has brain atrophy, gray matter atrophy, but the person that has chronic back pain with a neuropathic component, the brain has, the gray matter is more atrophy. And this is the area of the brain that atrophies, is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Why that is important is because Chronic pain with central sensitization, what happens is, it's, sorry, without central sensitization, a person that has chronic pain but doesn't have the central sensitization in the brain or the spinal cord, it means that um, the ascending pain pathways are intact, the descending inhibitory pathways are intact, they have an underlying pathology that explains the pain, there are no signs of central sensitization, there is a normal expected psychological response. Yes, of course, they are, you know, they're sad, their mood is depressed. But the pain has a function, and the function is to alert the individual to seek treatment. So an example of a good pain is, for example, hip osteoarthritis. Now, a bad pain, a bad chronic pain, is when you have chronic pain and central sensitization which is a malfunction of the pain system. There is no underlying pathology that we can find. You can do all kinds of exams and lab studies and MRIs and everything. You don't find an underlying pathology. It's because it's the pain system that is broken. There are many signs of central sensitization. There is an abnormal psychological response because now the brain is not responding well. And when pain activates the brain, also activates the area of concentration, sleep, mood, relationships, the person has chronic fatigue, both physical and mental, is because the brain is overwhelmed. This pain is not protecting the body. It does, it's not the alarm system that is protecting the house. It's like the alarm system that is broken. And one of the examples is fibromyalgia. So some of the signs and symptoms of uh, central sensitization, people have hypersensitivity to light, noise, touch, uh, food and medications, temperature, they have pain all over, there is fatigue, both physical and mental, sleep disturbance, numbness, swelling sensations, low libido, low mood. And when we examine these patients, we find some things are very specific. They have non dermatomal deficits when we do an exam with a light touch or pressure or heat and cold or vibration. So central sensitization can be summarized like this, is the amplification within the central nerve system resulting in a more intense perception of pain, thereby acting in the maintenance of chronic pain. 
And Paul Ingraham, he's a physiotherapist in Vancouver, and I like uh, what he says. He has a blog, and he has a very nice uh, blog about central sensitization. He says, ignorance of central sensitization leads to a wild goose chase and patients riding a merry-go-round of expensive and ineffective therapies. So what happens when we give opioids to someone that has chronic pain with central sensitization? If you look at all the list of adverse effects of opioids, opioids 28% cause nausea, 26% constipation, 24% somnolence, dizziness, pruritus, vomiting. Opioids also may cause hypogonadism, and uh, that's the sex hormones that are low, and one of the symptoms of uh, hypogonadism is fatigue, impotence, infertility. Also, opioids cause sleep apnea, and the symptoms of sleep apnea is headaches, fatigue, may even lead to a stroke. Also, opioids can cause opioid-induced hyperalgesia. We just saw this a few slides ago. So if you see all of this and all the risks with opioids, potentially causing overdose, misuse, abuse, leading to addiction. You put a patient that has chronic pain with central sensitization, you give them opioids, you give them all of these risks, complications, and adverse effects, it's no wonder why these people don't get better. They get more tired, their quality of life decreases, and, and what they need is exactly the opposite. Opioid-induced hyperalgesia is that effect that I mentioned to you, that the opioids will be uh, activating the NMDA receptor and causing the pain impulse to go faster and louder. We, in the book that we wrote, uh, the My Opioid Manager, we have this picture and we sit with our patients and we explain to them what is opioid-induced hyperalgesia. This is the pain levels were very high when the person didn't have opioids in their system, no opioids, a lot of pain. And then the physician started giving them opioids and in the first few weeks, days or weeks or one, two months, their pain went down, very, very down, so they felt better, never zero. You see the opioids for chronic pain were never able to provide a zero pain relief, it's very rare. And then the physician should have stopped increasing the dose here because now if that doctor continues increasing the dose, it's what we call opioid-induced hyperalgesia. The opioid is now causing more pain because of this phenomenon. So this is the right place to stop increasing the dose. So I'd like to finish this uh, webinar and uh, talking about um, some tips that I, I give you know, to my patients and we rewrite in the book, the myopian manager, how to communicate better with your healthcare provider. It could be your physician, your pharmacist, or your nurse about your opioids. So one important thing is whoever is prescribing your opioids and dispensing your opioids should have explained all of this to you. When you signed up for uh, an opioid, did you were you informed of all of this or of, of, of all the the small benefits of opioids for neuropathic pain? Did you, did you were you informed about uh, the potential for opioid-induced hyperalgesia? Were you informed about, uh, do you know if you have central sensitization so the opioids may be making your pain worse? Did you sign a treatment agreement where you gave consent for your doctor to prescribe these opioids to you? Did they explain what are your risks of uh, getting an overdose of this medication or even developing addiction to this medication. So this is very important. Um, when you sign up for surgery or any procedure, uh, they explain to you everything that can go wrong. Uh, the same thing should be explained to the patient when we give a prescription of opioids. The next thing is if you want to learn about this, uh, there is a lot of information on the web, on the internet, on social media. But most of the information, I would say, it's not, it's not coming from reliable sources. You have to really see, and I, I love this initiative of the, the Groot Pain HQ, which is a, a, an excellent resource and, uh, and, and center for reliable uh, sources of information. So I recommend you to read uh, materials, for example, the Myopioid Manager that we wrote for patients. And uh, you can download it, uh, you know, you can order a copy from the Canadian Pain Coalition or you can download for Android, iOS, uh, if you have an iPad, or you can go to um, 
opioidmanager.com and download the PDF of the book. The other tip that I want you to remember is it's very important that uh, even for people who have been on opioids for a long time, that their pain, their function, adverse effects, the risks are evaluated at every visit. All of my patients complete these questionnaires at every visit because things may change over time. And uh, this is what I ask my patients to complete, a brief pain inventory uh, that talks about pain interference with activities, the body pain diagram. Especially what I'm looking for is to see if the pain is not spreading to the body, which may make uh, uh, us think uh, if the, they're not developing central sensitization and, and opioid-induced hyperalgesia. And also to monitor the function and Number four is, um, you may ask uh, your, your physician about what, what is your pain diagnosis? What is the type of pain that they are treating? Is the dose of opioid appropriate to you? Maybe it's time to start reducing the dose. You have been on a medication for a long, long time, and now it's time to start tapering to see what happens if you're not developing any of the complications related to long-term opioid use, such as opioid-induced hypoalgesia, hypogonadism, and uh, sleep apnea, and many others. So this is a figure that we have in our book, The Myopioid Manager. And when patients tell me, well, doctor, but I've been on this medication for 10 years. I'm stable. I never had any complications. I'm OK. Why should I, th why should I think about um, stopping this medication right now? And they usually tell me, you know, I kind of uh, tested my body, and I tried to go one day, two days without this, this medication. And what happens is, really, my pain comes back, and so I know that I need this medication. So when they tell us this, uh, we open the book on this page, and we explain to them what is withdrawal-mediated pain, so WMP. This means that um, a person is on a stable dose of opioids, so they're taking opioids every day, so the opioids vary a little bit. Um, this is when you take the next dose of opioids, so let's say that you're taking opioids every 12 hours. So this is, you take one here, the opioid goes up in your system. And when it's time to get the next dose, you take the next dose here, and then it starts going up again. What happens is when the dose of the opioid in your blood starts lowering a little bit, this is especially important for people who are on a high dose of opioids. When there is a little bit of drop in the blood, they feel withdrawal there is a withdrawal from here to here. And withdrawal symptoms of opioids include pain all over the body, include agitation, include anxiety, uh, diarrhea, may include uh, some nausea and vomiting. So they, they feel bad when they have a little bit of withdrawal, and then they take the next dose, it goes up again, and the withdrawal is alleviated. So a person thinks that they need uh, an opioid because their pain is bad. But no, what they're treating is really the withdrawal-mediated pain. So the next one is uh, that we, we are now starting to recommend our patients who are on opioids to take home naloxone, which is it, you don't need a prescription. You can go to the pharmacy and get a kit of naloxone. Naloxone is a blocker, is an antagonist of opioids. And, and this is important because when people uh, are starting to take opioids, or even those who are on a long-term opioid therapy, but they may change the dose, or they may mix with a sleeping pill or with alcohol, what happens is that they may have a, an overdose, can be a fatal or a non-fatal overdose, and naloxone can block that uh, uh, overdose very quickly. So we recommend our patients, especially those who are on a higher dose of opioids, to buy a kit and, and teach some of their relatives or friends and uh, inform them, if you notice that I am taking my medication and I'm not breathing well and you can't wake me up, give me a shot of naloxone and, uh, to wake the person. So that's very important. Talk about, um, especially if a person is on high dose of opioids, talk to your healthcare professional about uh, taking home naloxone. So the, there are a lot of uh, resources. It's a new thing in Canada. So physicians and pharmacists in Canada, we are still learning how to do this. But there are some resources uh, from um, Canadian 
public health uh, programs and also United States how to identify symptoms of an accidental opioid overdose. So what happens is the person has a very slow or absent breathing, loss of consciousness, they are extremely small pupils, they have an irregular or a slow heartbeat, and they have purple fingernails or lips. When someone notices a person with these signs, uh, naloxone should be applied because there is no contraindication, there is no complication of giving naloxone. So those were the objectives that I planned for this webinar. So I hope that um, uh, you all that attended this webinar, you were able now to explain the scientific evidence of opioids for neuropathic pain. Also to describe the mechanisms why opioids can cause um, chronic pain to become worse. That's the mechanism of opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Also some tips for you to communicate better with your healthcare provider when talking about opioids prescription. So I'll go back to, I'll give back to Jillian. All right, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. There was one that came through, I saw, um, just a couple slides ago. Um, so Dr. Ferlin, the question is, um, what is the difference between peripheral uh, neuropathic pain and central neuropathic pain? Yeah, that's a very good question. So the, the central nerves, the, the, the nerve system is divided in central nerve system and peripheral nerve system. So the central nerve system is basically the brain and the spinal cord, and everything that exits the spinal cord, like the root, nerve roots, the nerves, and the, even the muscles, they are considered the peripheral nerve system. So when, when there is an injury or malfunction of a peripheral nerve, let's say carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, some people have, may have heard about carpal tunnel syndrome, which is a, a nerve at the wrist, um, and it's uh, compressed and the person has pain, that's a type of neuropathic pain uh, at the peripheral nerve system. Now if a person has a stroke and that stroke has affected the brain and now they have a pulse stroke pain, that's a central neuropathic pain. Okay. All right, so while we're waiting for others to add some questions in there, I had a question for you actually. Um, just when you were talking about uh, withdrawal symptoms, you mentioned that um, one of the withdrawal symptoms from taking opioids could be pain. Um, so how long would it take for a symptom like that um, to, mm -hmm. to fade? How long, how long would a person expect to experience that after withdrawing from opioids? Yeah, that's a good question. So it depends on uh, for how long the person had been on opioids. It also depends on the type of the opioid. It also depends on uh, the dose of the opioid. So if a person had a, a, you know, a dental procedure and they had an opioid for three days, if they stop the opioids, they will have very minimal withdrawal symptoms. For someone who had been on opioids for 10 years, 20 years, they will have uh, the withdrawal symptoms unfortunately may last weeks, days, weeks, and I even heard of months of withdrawal. I usually tell my patients for every year that you have been on opioids, expect almost a month of withdrawal symptoms. The thing is, they don't need to go on withdrawal. This is if they stop cold turkey. Uh, so we help our patients here if they, you know, when they don't need opioids anymore, like Ricardo that I showed in the video, we tapered him very slowly. And so you kind of, uh, you, you kind of uh, adapt your body to a lower dose every week or every two weeks so the body doesn't feel withdrawal. There are other techniques, for example, switching all of the opioids to something that is called buprenorphine and then tapering on buprenorphine is much easier because it doesn't cause a lot of withdrawal. It's one type of opioids that doesn't have, a, doesn't cause a lot of, a little bit, but not a lot of withdrawal symptoms. Great. Um, here's another question that just came through. What are some of the non-pharmacological therapies for treating neuropathic pain and do they work? Yes, yeah, they work very well, uh, amazingly well, sometimes even better than opioids. I have patients that they they're doing mindfulness-based uh, therapies and uh, they tell me that they practice a few minutes every day and they feel better as if they were taking like a Percocet or the Oxycontin a day 
I have other patients that got so much better with acupuncture. I got patients that they, uh, one, uh, he found um, self-hypnosis to be very helpful to him, and he found a video on YouTube, and he's a young guy, very athletic, and um, he has a very bad neuropathic pain, unfortunately, but he found that uh, an app and uh, a video, a YouTube video, helps him to do self-hypnosis. Exercises also uh, help people. It depends on the type of neuropathic pain. Some people get worse. Usually massage is not a good therapy because a lot of people with neuropathic pain, they have very sensitive um, skin and massage may aggravate uh, the pain, but some people may find it useful. Um, what else? Did I forget anything? Cognitive behavior therapy also has helped a lot of people. Sleep hygiene is so important. Uh, once you get into a sleep routine and um, and, and, and sleeping well because you are doing all of these sleep hygiene techniques. Uh, it has uh, tremendous effects on, um, on the pain. Okay. Oh, there's a couple questions that just came in here. Um, apologies, I'm just reading them. Uh, when you're initiating opioids, how do you determine when you have achieved the optimum dose without overshooting it? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. So I, because I ask all of my patients to debrief the inventory every time they come, I kind of monitor the brief pain inventory. So I don't expect the pain to go down, uh, you know, to zero, like 100% pain relief. I'm happy if they have 20, 30% pain relief, because I know if I keep going up on the dose, there will not be much they will not be much better than that. I may try to go a little bit up and see what happens, but then if it doesn't get more than 30% pain relief, I usually go back to the previous dose, but I really monitor their function. So if they, with that, uh, third, usually what happens is with that 30% pain relief, the patients are able, like this is what happened with Ricardo, we couldn't even touch him, and then we gave him the opioids, the anticonvulsants, antidepressants, then we were able to start doing the physiotherapy, the rehabilitation, he was able to uh, start on a, a new job, and because now he was participating more in rehabilitation, uh, he was able to get better, feel better, and then we were able to start reducing his medications. Our goal was never to maintain him on all of these high doses of all of these medications. It was just to enable him to go through rehab. Okay. Um, I think we just have time for one more question here. Um, mm -hmm. During the period of time when you would be taping, tapering off of an oper oh, sorry, I'm, my tongue is tying here. During the period of time um, when you would be tapering an opioid um, and you might be experiencing pain, would you ever suggest adding a neuropathic type of pain medication, for example, gabapentin? Oh yes, yes, absolutely. We do this, so first of all, when we are tapering, if a person is only taking opioids, for neuropathic pain, that's not appropriate. As I showed uh, the algorithm by Dr. Dwight Mulling from Canadian Pain Society, you see that um, there are other classes of medications that are first line, and the reason they are first line is because they're better than opioids. So I usually try uh, one or two or even three of those medications in the first class. We may combine one or two or three, we may do three together, and uh, and then when you start tapering the opioids, I may also use Nabilone, which is a synthetic cannabinoid. Uh, it's in the third line in the algorithm, but I use a can, a Nabilone to help tapering the opioids, uh, gabapentin, I use uh, duloxetine, venlafaxine, all of this uh, uh, to help um, uh, reducing the dose. And then, uh, and then later we'll try to reduce all of the medications to the minimum possible dose, right? We don't want to keep anyone on high dose of anything, including gabapentin. We try to lower to the maximum, to the minimum possible, maximizing the other self-management um, strategies, the non-pharmacological, the psychosocial, uh, the other strategies. Okay, great. 
Well, I think we've run out of time here, but thank you all for joining us today, and thank you, Dr. Ferland, for joining us and sharing all of that information. I think I speak for everyone when I say that was really informative and, uh, and thorough. I think I personally learned a lot, and I think everyone else did too. So thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure.